Well, I have to start then by promising you that I did not call Ellen and James and tell them what the teaching was about, nor did I call Dennis and tell him what I was going to share tonight. They had absolutely no idea, and yet um, the prophecies were, were pretty amazing, like Ellen with no fears, and then you said, cover them up. I mean, it, correct me if I'm, I haven't heard cover up your fear. Has anybody heard that? I, I can't remember hearing that before. And yet we're going to read in Ecclesiastes tonight that darkness covers up those who die um, at different times. And, and it leaves, it, it covers up their name. And we don't have to worry about being covered up, but our fears will be covered up. I thought that was really powerful. And then, um, Dennis, in your prophecy, life life is short. Yeah, in, in Ecclesiastes 6, God calls it a shadow. And, uh, and, and we'll go into that. And then, James, uh, the, the three times in the prophecy, you said you're not alone. And that has a lot to do with Ecclesiastes 6, uh, because, because it's, uh, Ecclesiastes 6 is fairly cynical, actually. It's in the, 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 you know, the middle of Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes kind of starts with pointless, pointless, says the preacher, the sage, everything is pointless, and kind of goes downhill from there, <laughs> and kind of weaves this kind of cynical web, and then, and then at the end, it starts pulling out and telling you about how God is great, and, and he's going to, going to, um, you know, deliver us, and, and, you know, he's going to reward everybody for what they've done, and then this one, James, I, I got to tell you, I thought this was absolutely funny. God says, I know what is behind. Now, if you think about that, okay, God says, I know what is behind. And, and you and I would be like, yeah, well, we do too. We've got encyclopedias and, and we've, got, we've got history books and this and that and anything. And because of our translation of Ecclesiastes 6 today, Schlegel and I got into a conversation about the fact that in Hebrew, one of the words for what's coming in the future is the word behind. And the, and the reason for that is if it was behind you, you couldn't see it. And that's the situation with the future. We can't see the future. So there are times when the Bible will talk about it being behind, and it doesn't mean that it's behind us. It's the future, but it just means you can't see it. So it's in darkness. And so when you said that the night, James, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I just learned that today. And here it comes out in a prophecy. This is, you know, that's like God going, knock, knock, I'm here. <laughs> So let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Um, this is where um, Schlegel and I were, were in this, and, and translating with Schlegel is nothing, uh, it's just unbelievable, it's fantastic, it's so much fun. Um, and so we start out with, uh, and, and like I say, you have to be careful because you can read Ecclesiastes and you're kind of waiting for these wonderful, uplifting, cheerful words. And even Bill, by the end of the chapter, kind of went, <laughs> we got to kind of start getting later in the book. So we get some of those great words, because this could, this can really take you downhill, but it's just part of a process. It's part of the process of what is happening in the book of Ecclesiastes as the author of God through the sage, um, who's called the preacher in the King James Version, but it's not a preacher. It's, um, it really is a sage, and that's why we've translated it in the REB. And he starts out and he says, there's an evil that I've seen under the sun, and it weighs heavily upon humanity. And um, it, it weighs heavily is an, is an English idiom. It's uh, in the Hebrew, it's simply it is heavy on humanity. And one of the things we have to be careful of um, in the Bible is when it says there's an evil, because the Bible uses evil in two very distinct ways. And one is that it's simply a tragedy, that there's um, like, you know, for example, if your, you know, if your cow dies unexpectedly or something like that, and it's a tragedy then the Bible calls that an evil. 
and then there's an evil that has a moral connotation to it like the devil is is evil and he's he's morally evil but then he causes evil and so we we need to be aware and and we spent a long time not this session but last time talking about the word evil and if we wanted to try and parse when a situation was morally evil and call it evil and when a situation was um just simply a bad happening um and, and you wouldn't necessarily call it an evil and we finally decided that the the, the line was too thin you we we, there, there were too many times where a tragedy had a little moral evil or there was moral evil, but it also was associated with a tragedy. And, and so really, it's just something that the, the, the reader has to know in their mind. When you see the word evil, you're looking for, is there a moral element to this or is it simply a tragedy? And in this case, it's both. Um, the, the, we live in a fallen world. So there's a, a moral evil behind what happens on earth a lot of the times, but it's also from a human perspective, it's also tragic. And so now he's going to say, okay, so here's this evil. And verse two starts out, well, it's a man to whom God gives wealth, riches, and honor so that he lacks nothing for himself of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him the ability to eat of it, but a stranger eats it. This is pointless and a severe affliction. And we're going to start out with a severe affliction. Um, this is, um, um, it, it's not quite evil. It's the same basic word, but it's a feminine adjective rather than, rather than a, um, a, just a straight noun form. So, you wouldn't call it evil, I think, uh, so severe is about right. And then the word affliction can also be translated sickness. And we really, we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what we, how we were going to translate this. If you look at your other Bible versions, there are, um, there are versions that translate this an evil sickness. And it, what, it is an affliction, and we decided to go with that because it, um, it is an affliction to be in that position, and you might know people that they're, um, you know, it's, it's like you work all your life, you finally get ready to retire, and then you get cancer, you know, something like that, that it's, a, it's an affliction. But based on the evil nature of a fallen world, it's, it's also a sickness. And one of the things that we can look forward to, and this came up in the prophecies too, you know, Dennis's prophecy the next life will be glorious. You know what? You want to know what this life is going to be like? Well, here it is in Ecclesiastes. It's an evil sickness. The, the devil's in control and, and life is, is just difficult. And it, it, it talks, you know, um, one of the things that takes a while to build in our understanding of scripture is it takes a while to build the cultural background of where we can see what's going on. So when it says, a man to whom God gives wealth, riches, and honor, he lacks nothing for himself of all that he desires, yet God does not give him the ability to eat it, uh, but a stranger eats it. And, and why would it say a stranger? And what is, what is buried in this that you'd have to understand the culture to really get is that the man doesn't have any children. Because if a man had wealth and riches and honor, and then a stranger wouldn't ever be the one to enjoy that, his family would, his kids would. And so, you know, one of the, one of the great tragedies, one of the, if you want to call it an evil sickness, is when a man, you know, doesn't have children in the, in the biblical world. You know, if a woman didn't have children, she was considered cursed. If a man didn't have children, you know, he would kind of try and trade out wives and try to have children. And so here, the stranger eats his stuff. And, and you know, the, uh, the sage goes and says, wow, this is, this is pointless and a severe affliction. So um, 
One more thing I wanted to point out about verse 2, um, God does not give him the ability to eat of it, but a stranger eats it. Um, we made the decision, uh, note, you'll notice that a lot of the English versions have the word enjoy there. Um, he doesn't get to enjoy it, but a stranger enjoys it. And we made the conscious decision to stay with the Hebrew text, eat, because if you go, if you go to John chapter 6, here we go with, in, in fact, just let's, let's just go there. Let's just real quick go to John chapter 6. Um, uh, I'd love to with my mouse. does not seem to be at all cooperating. There we go. Nothing like having an uncooperative mouse. Um, so in John chapter 6, Jesus is, is talking uh, to, the, uh, to the crowds and he, he walked on water, and then he starts, um, verse 22, talking about being the bread of life. Um, and verse 31, uh, he talks about Moses gave them the bread of heaven to eat. Um, and let's see. Um, in uh, verse 41, um, Jesus was the one who said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Um, then, yeah, verse 51, Christ says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Indeed, the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then 52, therefore, the Jews argued intensely with each other, saying, how is this man able to give us his flesh to eat? Now, the interesting thing here is if you go back into the Hebrew text, there are a number of places in the Old Testament, and here in Ecclesiastes is one of them, where eat was a very common idiom for to experience or to enjoy. It was a very common idiom. And so when Christ said here, you know, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Basically, what Christ was saying in pretty plain, you know, Hebraic idiom was, if you experience me, if you enjoy me, if you, if you fulfill yourself on me, then you'll live forever. So the question then here is, um, when the Jews and the Jews here in the Gospel of John, the word Jew in the Gospel of John is used in a special sense. And you can see this if you search through the Gospel of John. It didn't just mean a Jew by nationality. The word Jew in the Gospel of John referred to the leaders. So these are the Pharisees. These are the ones that, this is John 6. These are the guys that in John 8, 44, he's going to say, you are of your father, the devil. And so, you know, and, and Christ said of these people, you know, you cannot hear what I say. And, you know, when we read the Bible, one of the things we're looking for is, I'm, I'm, when I'm reading the Bible, I'm looking for spiritual insights. What is the text telling me? Christ looked at the Jews. He said, you are of your father, the devil. Then he says, you can't hear my words. And then we see that all through the testimony of Christ. Christ will make a statement and they'll completely misconstrue it. And they just miss what he said completely. And, and because the, 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 between the, the demon that occupies the mind and just the demonic mindset, they just can't understand the things of God. And so here's Christ speaking in an idiom, using the word eat, that they should have very, very quickly grabbed onto. You know, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. In other words, you've got to experience me. You've got to enjoy me. You've got to fill yourself with me. This was very common in the Old Testament, very common in the Hebrew idiom. G uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, your words were found and I did eat them. <laughs> they were the joy and rejoicing in my heart. What's Jeremiah saying? He's saying that, that I took them in, I experienced them, I enjoyed them, I filled myself with them. Very common idiom. And yet here are the Jews, Christ speaks this, and they're like, 
how's he going to give us this flesh to eat? <laughs> and they didn't get it at all. And what does that tell us about these Jews in John chapter 6? They were just, they were, they were demonically motivated. They just weren't getting what Christ was saying. It's not that Christ was speaking in a way they shouldn't have understood it. Um, they, they, Christ was speaking in a way they absolutely should have understood it. So here, in going back to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, so here's this man to whom God gives wealth, riches, honor, he doesn't lack a thing, yet God doesn't give him the ability to enjoy it, and instead a stranger, not even one of his own family, gets to enjoy it because he doesn't have any kids. And it says, wow, this is pointless. And, and it's, an, it's an evil sickness. It's a severe affliction. It's, it's something that's happening on the earth that should never happen. And it happens because of the fallen world. And so then he kicks in verse, in verse 3, and he goes in a different direction. So the guy in verse 2 doesn't have any children. Now the guy in verse 3, or... If a man fathers a hundred children, okay, verse two, the guy doesn't have any kids. This guy doesn't have that problem. This guy's got a hundred children. Furthermore, he lives many years so that the day of his years are many. Now, he, this guy should be really happy. You remember the Psalm that says about children, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Here, here's a guy that He's got a hundred children and he lives many years and, and he should be happy. But it says, but his soul is not satisfied with good things. So he's, um, there's something going on inside this man where he can't enjoy life. And I think this is one of the things that we'll see in the millennial kingdom. When, when the devil is able to turn some of the natural people against Christ at the end of the thousand years, you know, and what, you know, our, the, the testimony of the world around us is that you can live with basically all of your needs met. You can have food, clothing, a big house, um, a, a good job, nice car, all the stuff. And, and be bitter and be unhappy and be, you know, really be miserable in life. Or you can be actually very poor, um, but, but be very content and be very happy. That, that contentment and joy is an internal thing. It's not an external thing. And if you, if you are not joyful on the inside, if you're completely miserable on the inside, then, then people avoid you. People stay away from you. Um, you know, there's that an ancient saying, maybe when you guys know where it comes from, but it's that ancient saying that says, if you laugh, the world laughs with you, but if you cry, you cry alone. Yeah, Carol, I see you nodding your head. I don't know if you know where that comes from. I, I just, uh, but I know the saying, you know, and if here, here's a guy that, you know, has he got kids? My gosh, he's got 100 kids. He lives many years. The days of his life are many, but he's, he, he's, not, he's not blessed. He's not satisfied. He's miserable. And look, you, you want to know how miserable he is? It says, moreover, he has no burial. Now, wait a minute. What was a, the primary, one of the primary responsibilities of children? was to bury the parents when they died. You know, if you, if you think about it, you might even remember, uh, where is that in the Gospels that, um, wait a minute, I'll find it because I wrote it down in the, in, the, in the commentary. Yeah, go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. And this is one of those verses, um, in Matthew 8, 21, that, that uh, if we don't understand it, then... Um, it can make Christ look really mean and cruel. So Christ is rounding up disciples. Um, and so in verse 18, um, you know, he gave, he's, he's leaving the area, verse 19, an expert in the law came and said, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. 
Uh, Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds of heaven have nests, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Why would he say that to the expert in the law? Because in that culture, the experts in the law were at the upper crust of, of society. They were like the doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. So they had, they had the big houses, they had the nice chariots, they had the slaves. You know, in Christ, Christ didn't say, you can't follow me. But here comes a guy from the, from the upper crust of society. He's used to, you know, nice soft beds and big houses and lots of slaves to serve him and stuff like that. And he, and he comes to Christ and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Christ, it, he doesn't say no, but he says, okay, I just want you to know this is going to be really different than the life you're used to if you decide to follow me. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm itinerant. I'm from town to town. You never know where you're going to eat, what you're going to eat, where you're going to stay, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so, so that was a very honest thing that he said in verse 21. And another disciple said to him, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. Well, the guy's got a sense of responsibility. I'm going to go bury my dad. And, and Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And that sounds really mean and nasty. But the, 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 what we have to understand from the culture is the man's father wasn't dead. Because in that culture, when someone died, you buried them the same day. Uh, they had no way to preserve the body. They knew that dead bodies spread disease. Uh, very, very hot in Israel. So the custom was that if a person died, they were, they were buried before sunset. Um, and of course, that's what they wanted to do with Christ too, take him off the cross and bury him before sunset. Um, and so what, what's going on here in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, when Christ says, leave the dead to bury their dead, the guy's like, well, I've got to bury my dad. Well, <laughs> his dad wasn't dead, because if his dad was dead, he'd be burying his dad. He wouldn't be following Christ around. So what is he saying? He's saying, you know, Jesus is, is going through Samaria. Jesus is going through Jerusalem. Jesus is growing, going into Ituria. Jesus is going into, into Perea. Jesus is going up into Lebanon. He's going to the area of Decapolis. He's traveling all over. Sometimes it takes two or three days to get from where Christ is back to here in the Galilee. And the guy's like, I, I, I can't go that far away. If my dad dies, then, then I'm going to have to be there right, right pretty much away. So basically what this man is telling Christ is, I can't follow you until after my father dies. Now, what does Jesus know? Jesus knows that he's going to be dead within a year. And the chances are the father's not going to die within a year. So he's, he just says, look, you know, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. If, if something happens your father will be taken care of. But the chances of the father being dead in that kind of time is, is pretty slim. But at least the guy has got the right idea. He says, you know, um, he says, I want to bury my dead. And, and that was a prime responsibility of children. And so here's a guy, he's got a hundred kids, Ecclesiastes 6.3. And he lives many years, but he has no burial. And so in the culture, what that tells you is that this man has been so curlish and so miserable that he's, he's alienated everyone so that he can't even get a burial. <laughs> that, and so, wow, this is, uh, um, and that's why verse 3 says, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. Now, why is that? We're going to find that out as we keep reading. A stillborn child is better than this guy who's lived many years and has been miserable his whole life. Verse 4, for the stillborn comes pointlessly. He comes pointlessly. He's, he's, he's born, the child is born dead. So there doesn't seem to be any point from a human perspective. There doesn't seem to be any point to the birth. He comes pointlessly and goes in darkness. And then here's where, Ellen, your, your prophecy had that about being covered. And his name is covered with darkness. 
And, and what does that mean? Well, in the biblical culture, what was a name? Well, a name was your name, but it was also your reputation. Remember, that's why we say, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, it's Christ's reputation, it's Christ's authority, and it's also your memory. You know, that if you go through the biblical text or places where it talks about their name will no longer be remembered. Remembering, remembering somebody's name was a really big deal. But here's a child that never even breathed. And so his name, his any authority, any, any reputation that he might have in his memory, it's covered in darkness. He is, he is very quickly forgotten. And so that's what it's, what it's talking about. And then uh, verse 5, it has not seen the sun nor known anything because it was born dead. Yet it has more rest than the other man. And here's where we've got to be careful. A lot of the versions put a period after man, but that then misses the point. The, the last sentence in verse 5 and the first sentence in verse 6 in most versions, are one sentence. So here's this, this stillborn baby. It hasn't seen the sun nor known anything, yet it has more rest than the other man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over and fails to enjoy good things. So here you've got two people. Well, two people, yeah. One is a stillborn child, it's, it's born dead, so all it knows is rest, rest and death. And then here's this guy who's curlish, miserable, but he lives a long life. He could live 2,000 years, and yet he's miserable the whole time. Which one has more rest? The stillborn. There's no rest in being miserable. You guys know that. When you're, when you're mentally upset and, and you're miserable and you're anxious and you're worried, there's no rest. And here's God. He's saying, wow, you know, honestly, if that's the way you're going to live, if you're going to live a life that's you're miserable and you're worried and you're upset and you're not peaceful and you're not happy and you can't enjoy anything, good grief. A kid born dead's better than you. Why? And then it goes on in, in the end of verse six. Do not all go to one place. I mean, okay, you live 2,000 years, which is over twice as long as Methuselah, who lived, what, 969 years. So, okay, you live 2,000 years, but every year has been miserable. Where do you end up going after 2,000 years? Sheol, the state of being dead. You're dead. <laughs> so let me see. The stillborn child was born dead, and it was resting from the time it, it was born. You, you were born. You lived 2,000 miserable years, didn't get a day of rest of your life, and now you're where the stillborn child is. Who's better off? <laughs> and, and, and that's what it's saying. And this is a... This is a um, a really kind of a backhanded way to get us to look at our life and just say, God, Zooks, you know, am I blessed in life? Am I excited in life? Am I happy in life? Am, am I, do I wake up with a smile on my face? Do I look at this life as a privilege? Or do I look at this life as a burden? Because if all I'm going to be is miserable, my gosh, if I just lived a couple of weeks and died, I'd be better off than I am now. You see what's going on here in the text? This is, this is a, a really strong, a really strong affirmation from God and exhortation from God that we need to do what it takes to make our lives worth it, fun, enjoyable, fulfilling. You know, just a very powerful, very powerful truth. Then uh, we, then we kind of start, we, we kind of flip subjects a little bit, and it says, all the labor, this is verse 7, all the labor of a man is for his mouth. <laughs> now, basically, you think about it, um, if people didn't need to eat, people would be a lot lazier than they are. There's, there's a lot of people that would just kind of 
figure out how to get a sleeping bag and lay around their whole life if they didn't need to eat. <laughs> but, but because we need to eat and then we need money. And so basically what it's saying in verse seven is, look, the, a lot of the, the work and production of mankind is due to the fact that we need to eat. And then it goes on to say, yet the appetite is not filled and the appetite there um, is, it means more than appetite. It's your, it's your, it, 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 that's the primary meaning is appetite, but also it's the Hebrew word nefesh, soul, you know, um, yeah, you can have a full stomach, but it doesn't, it doesn't fill you up. Um, the, um, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily fill your soul. By the way, um, here again, we see the use of vocabulary in the Old Testament that was common in the culture that Christ is going to then use in his speaking. So, for example, if you say uh, the, the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet his, his appetite, which is true, his soul, which is true, is, is not filled now listen to Christ, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. So what, what's Christ doing? Here's a guy with, with all of his appetite, eating with his mouth, and yet his soul isn't filled. What's he, wh why not? Because he's hungering for things that, that food alone won't be able to give him. And so there are people who have plenty of food, but their soul isn't filled. They, they want to live in a great place. They want to live in a great world. And so here, it's, you know, for Christ, you can just see almost, almost expecting his audience to have known Ecclesiastes and saying, look, if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you will be filled. And that's, that just pulls like right off of this. It's just fabulous. And then verse 8, um, again, pulling from the cultural background. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? Okay, now wait a minute. If we're reading Psalms and we're reading Proverbs and we're listening to the culture, then... Wisdom, according to Proverbs, wisdom is how you get riches and honor and your house is full of good things and your wife is wonderful, Proverbs 31. So wisdom leads to all this cool stuff. And yet now we're reading Ecclesiastes and it's like, wait a minute. Here is the guy who obviously was wise because he's got riches and he's got honor and he's got a name and he's got a hundred children. So um, ugh, he's, uh, he's miserable. Wait a minute. That doesn't fit the paradigm. I'm supposed to have wisdom and then I get riches and honor and wife and kids and everything's great. And here's this guy that has the riches and the honor and the fame and the wife and the kids. And is miserably, didn't he have to be wise to get those things? I thought that's what Proverbs says. And so all of a sudden you're here. Well, then what advantage does the wise man more than a fool? And it's a question. He's not saying the wise man doesn't have an advantage. He's, 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 this is Hebrew poetry, and he's speaking this to, to pull you in. So you have to say to yourself, well, wait a minute now. Okay. What advantage does the wise man have over the fool? It, it, is it money? Well, not if you're miserable. Is it having a hundred kids? Well, not if you're miserable. Well, what is the advantage of the wise man? Well, you have an opportunity to engage God at a deeper level, engage life at a deeper level, be blessed at a deeper level. And that's and and really that's what's going on here. The wise man does have an advantage over the fool, as Proverbs says, but it's not an inherent advantage. You have to, in your soul, be blessed to take advantage of those things that are available in the flesh. And that's a great teaching. And so then 
he, he then goes on and says, what advantage does the poor man have who knows how to walk before the living? Here's the poor man, and he's thinking, if I could be wise, I'd get uh, riches and wealth and honor and the kids and the wife and the, and the big house and the chariot. And, and it's like, no, you might have those things, but if you're miserable, you're going to be right where that other guy was and the stillborn child was better than him. You know, so this, this is paradigm breaking. You know, he's, he's breaking paradigms that were set up. And it's kind of interesting because the same guy that wrote Ecclesiastes wrote Proverbs, or at least most of them. So you have Solomon writing Proverbs saying all the great things that are going to happen to you if, you if you become wise. And then he writes Ecclesiastes about how your life can be a total wreck. And you can have all these things that you've got by virtue of being wise. <laughs> And so you have to, <laughs> so you have to put it together and see the whole picture. And it's like it says, I believe in Ecclesiastes two, where who can enjoy things without Him, without God? See, and then Ecclesiastes eleven and twelve, where God will bring all these things into judgment and He'll reward people. So in the background of this whole thing is God, and and He's breaking paradigms in the flesh. He's breaking fleshly paradigms. And then he says, verse 9, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. And, and what is that? What's that talking about? Again, you know, it's interesting that the timing of, of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, it's Proverbs. I got it in my commentary, so I'm just going to go there rather than guess. It is Proverbs 17, 24. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24. And we'll get a good look at what this is talking about. Uh, let's see, Proverbs 17, verse 24, um, says, Wisdom is with the one who understands, but the eyes of a fool or are on the ends of the earth. You know, the fool is never happy with what he has. They, uh, uh, the fool is always looking here in Ecclesiastes, you know, better is the sight of the eyes. What's in front of you? What do you see? What do you really have to work with? What's the reality? Versus the wandering of desire, which Proverbs 17, 24 explains as his eyes are on the ends of the earth. Oh, if we get into this business deal, we'll make millions. Oh, if we do this over here, oh, you know, we'll have whatever it happens to be. And, and the, the, instead of the fool looking around at what he's got and saying, this is what I've got, this is what I'm going to deal with, their eyes are on the end of the earth. The wandering of the eyes are, are all over. And there's a... Um, Again, a, um, an exhortation for us to look around at what we have, you know, versus the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. We need to learn to look at, at our own grass. Uh, and, and he says, you know, when, you're, when your eyes wander all over, then uh, he says, frankly, it's, it's pointless and it's like hurting wind. <laughs> it accomplishes absolutely zero. Um, and then there's a, a really a kind of a, a clean break between 9 and 10 um, from the standpoint of a, a context. But, but what it's going to do here is it's going to talk about um, the fighting with God. And it's going to do it in a very, what to me was a very, very strange way. Um, and, and this is something that's much easier to see in the Hebrew than in the English as uh, we worked out with, with Bill today. Um, if, you, if you look first 10, what man was already, his name was called, and it was known that he is man. Now, this is the first time in the, proverb, in the, in the, in the uh, chapter that man is the word Adam. Before this, the word man has always been ish. And in Hebrew, ish is the masculine, and sha is the feminine. Uh, and it's been ish throughout the chapter, uh, man, uh, that, uh, that type of thing. And now it's going to talk about, remember, you've got the wandering of the eyes. And he says, you know, what man was 
already his name was called and it was known that he is man or we could even technically go Adam there. In other words, you know, um, God worked with what he had, was right there. He made Adam. And what happened with Adam? Verse, the last half of the verse says, it was known that he is Adam and he cannot contend with one who is mightier than he. Now, who did Adam contend with who ended up being mightier than he? It'd be God. Yeah, Dennis, you're right. It's, that's exactly right. And basically what this proverb, what this, uh, this poetic stanza is doing in Ecclesiastes is it's saying, look, all this stuff that we're talking about, you know, this was set in motion by God. You know, God's the one who made the world the way it is. God's the one who made mankind the way he did. And Adam wasn't satisfied with it. And God said, don't eat of the tree. And Adam goes charging off and eats of the tree and gets himself in a lot of problems. And so that's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of strange, but that's what's going on here in the verse. And thankfully, the scholars argue a little bit, the scholars agree that we're talking about Adam. What they don't agree with was about his name being called. They're not sure whether this is God naming Adam or Adam naming the animals. Uh, but, but every commentary I read, every single one tied this back to Genesis chapter 2 with Adam, and it's kind of, kind of interesting. And it, it, the, the point of the verse seems to be that God made Adam. Adam had a life that he could have lived in the Garden of Eden, but no, he wasn't happy with that, and his eyes wandered all over, and so he decided to fight with God and try to get a better, better deal, if you will. And, and he ended up losing and causing a calamity. And that seems to be what's going on here. He cannot contend with one who's mightier than he. And then verse 11, in the context of contending with God, for there are many things that increase pointlessness. And so what we've got to see here is the context is arguing or arguing with God, or if you will, fighting with the fabric of life. And um, it's much broader in the Hebrew than in English because verse 11, uh, for there are many things, the Hebrew word is dabar, which you might be familiar with. It's a common Hebrew word, and it means words, commonly words or things. And the native Hebrew reader would see Debar and say, okay, there's a double meaning here, that there are many words that increase pointlessness. What would some of the words be that would increase pointlessness? Well, Adam was contending with God. You know, he wanted to be like, if you, if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And Adam could argue with God all he wanted and it wouldn't, it wouldn't make one bit of difference. It would just increase the amount of pointless conversation. Or you could go many things that increase pointlessness and tie this verse to the following verse, to verse 12. For who knows what is good for a man in his life all the days of his pointless life? So basically, in other words, you can try doing all kinds of things to change your life, but be careful of the wandering of the mind versus, you know, the wandering of desire versus what you see and what's right in front of you. So basically there, um, verse 11, there are many things that increase pointlessness, and that's really true in our lives. People can get involved in all kinds of pointless activities. They can get involved with all kinds of pointless words and pointless conversations. And part of living a godly life is being able to, to kind of sense, develop a sense of when, when is something a dead-end road? When is it going to go nowhere? When is it a waste of time? When is it pointless? And, the, and the, the godly person develops a sense 
for walking by the Spirit of God and figuring out what's pointless. When are the things I'm doing pointless? When are the words I'm saying pointless? And then, you know, um, and, and then cutting that off and bringing ourselves back to where we're in the sight of the eyes, what's, what's clearly in front of us. And then, you know, the next, the close of verse 12, how does that profit man? It doesn't profit man to pile up pointless words and pile up pointless things. Verse 12, for who knows what is good for a man in life all the days of his pointless life that he makes like a shadow. And, and it's really true. Uh, sometimes we're, you know, our lives just go by so fast. Um, you know, that it's just our lives are like a shadow. Interestingly enough, our generation has a much better grip on the flow of our lives than other generations have. If you think, like, I know all kinds of things about my life as a child because of my mother's, you know, baby and childhood pictures. And she can say, this is when you did this, and this is when you did If it wasn't for those photographs, there's a whole bunch of my childhood that would be just a total blank. <laughs> and then, you know, and then there's a lot of other things that you look at your photo, go through your photo. Oh, I forgot I did it. Oh, I forgot. I, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of life that we crystallize because of photographs and because of our ability to have journals and that kind of stuff. In the, in the biblical world, when those things didn't exist, a lot of life that behind you was just gone. You know, it just didn't have an impact. And so, you know, that, that he makes like a shadow. By the way, the word he here, um, the scholars are divided. Does, does the man make his life like a shadow by the fact that he just can't keep up with it, can't keep track of it? Or is it God that makes man's life like a shadow by just the way he designed us and designed our minds? And, and the, the text is unclear, and actually it could be either or both. And then it says, it closes by saying, for who can tell a man what will be after him? Here you go with the word after or behind under the sun. So in the future, what's going what's gonna to happen? You know, if you think about when Christ says, follow after me, it's behind, <laughs> follow behind me. But here we're using behind in the sense of the future. We use this in English the same way. What will be after him come later than him under the sun. So we, we don't know. Nobody can, can tell us what's going to come in the future unless it's going to be God. And of course, that's where the text is going to go in the chapters ahead. So this is really a, um, you know, it, it, it can be a heavy chapter in one sense, but in the other sense, it's, it's an exciting chapter because it, it, especially to me anyway, the thing that was most impacting to me in the translation of this today with Schlegel was the fact that, you know, if, if we don't grab hold of our lives and, and see what we see, what's the sight of our eyes and grab a hold of what's in front of us and then decide to make our lives fun, fulfilling, meaningful, then honestly, you know, it's just, we're all going to die. So you live a miserable life and then die. A stillborn child is better than that. And that, that made a tremendous impact on me today. So anyway, that's what I wanted to share tonight. I, I hope it's a blessing to you and uh, glad to entertain questions or discussion or wherever you guys want to go with this.